In the land of Zemuria, empires are forged, lands are conquered, alliances broken, glory taken, grand plans made manifest, and at the apex of everything exist heroes. Outside of learning Japanese and making Japanese videos, I do actually have other hobbies. For one, I very much enjoy my games, and my favourite genre of games are JRPGs. When people think of JRPGs or Japanese role-playing games, they immediately think of the big hitters, Final Fantasy, Persona, or Kingdom Hearts. Now, even though I enjoy JRPGs, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest JRPG player, in that I haven't played every title under the sun. Disclaimer here, I've never actually played the Persona games, but I have been fortunate to play some of the main titles and also to play some hidden gems in the past as well. I'm looking at you, Eternal Sonata. Now the JRPGs that I enjoyed personally all had one thing in common. They had a great story. I mean, you're putting in about 50 hours of gameplay. That's a lot of time to sink into it. And for me, you need a good story to hook you in and to keep you going throughout those 50 hours. It's all good having a game with flashy gameplay and crisp graphics, but if the story is pants, then it's not going to hook me. Now while there are some good examples from the mainstream publishers, like Square Enix with Nier Automata and Namco Bandai with the Tales games, it's actually a smaller Japanese publisher that blows them out of the water. Neon Falcon, a company that's been around since 1981, are largely credited as being the pioneers of the modern JRPG. If you don't know about the company, chances are you'll know of their JRPG Juggernaut, the East series, which itself has been around since 1987, and is just on the horizon of releasing their ninth game in the official series with East 9 Monstrum Nox. The formula is pretty simple for East games, fast paced combat, killer soundtracks and great story. I've played both Open Felgana and Origins and both were a highly enjoyable experience for me, and it's clear that the company puts real care into their product. But it's not the East series that we're here to talk about, for I believe that Neon Falcon have actually one-up themselves with their second mainstay series. A series that I believe is the magnum opus of JRPG storytelling and world building. I give to you the Trails games from the Legend of Heroes series. Trails games, or Kiseki games as they're known in Japan, are a series of arcs that take place on the same fictional continent of Zamuria. On this continent, there exist multiple kingdoms, empires, and independent states, each with their own history and culture, and it's in these different states that the games take place. At present, there are nine games in the main series. Three make up the Trails in the Sky games that take place in the Kingdom of Laburl. A duology of Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure make up the subseries in Crossbell. And finally, the most recent subseries, Trails of Cold Steel, completes the set with four games of its own. These games share the same world, the same characters, and the same overarching story. Now, before we delve into the world, let's have a quick look at the graphics and gameplay. Aesthetically, the Trails games won't be winning any awards. Graphics are simple, and can look fairly outdated on newer hardware even with the newest entry, Trails of Cold Steel 4. The graphics are not terrible though, and they do offer enough of a dynamic palette to keep you intrigued. Gameplay wise, it's a fairly linear experience for the most part, moving from town to town via an overworld map, taking on side missions and advancing the main story. Enemies can be seen on the overmap and you can gain advantages by attacking from behind, or in the later entries, stunning the enemies to gain an even greater edge. Once in a battle, you'll find that the Legend of Heroes series uses a turn-based system from character to character. Each character will get their own turn to make an attack, buff up, or if you're a coward, run away. Every character also has their own unique move pool, and some abilities will have side effects, which can give you the chance to attack again or apply effects. On the left, you'll also get a timeline, which will show you who is due to attack next, and it gives you the opportunity to work around your enemy's turns by using your abilities wisely. The general formula for battles stays fairly similar throughout the series, with only minor additions given from game to game, 
So if you make a jump from the oldest game to the newest, the combat will still feel familiar. It's simple, but it's enough to keep you on your toes and to decide what course of action you should take to get the most effective outcome. Do you go for the jugular with a fully charged S-Craft, or do you play it safely and spam delay your opponent? While overworld battles with common enemies are quite simple, boss battles are, for the most part, challenging, with each having their own unique abilities that can decimate a party if you're not careful. Though there are issues with difficulty spiking every now and then, the good thing about these battles is that they never feel cheap. Sure, you're going to have a hard time every now and then, but there is always a strategy to achieve victory. Customization is also a big part of The Legend of Heroes. Each character will have their own augments called Quartz, which give them stats or in some cases abilities. It gives you the opportunity to build a party in the way you want, however you might feel shoehorned a little bit considering each character already has a soft role assigned to them based on their own abilities. For example, some characters are obviously meant to be a caster, others are clearly meant to be a damage sponge, but there's still enough freedom there to make a party in the way you want. Now one more thing I want to mention before we move on to the story is the soundtrack. If you've got a good soundtrack in your game, you're off to a very good start with me personally. And Neon Falcom are the masters of soundtrack design. I don't think there is a single soundtrack in any Neon Falcom game that I've played that I hate. They've just got this ability to know what music is going to suit the mood of what you're doing. For example, for the more sombre scenes, they know exactly what needs to be played in order to reach that correct emotional pitch. However, if you're amidst a horde of enemies and you need something to keep you going, you get some amazing guitar riffs that really pump you up for what you're going to be seeing. I'm pretty certain it was Neon Falcon soundtracks which made me want to learn guitar in the first place. I mean, listen to this stuff. But as I said before guys, it's not the gameplay or the graphics that have me stick around, it's the story. And this is where the Legend of Heroes series really shines. As said before, the games take place on the same continent as Zamuria, and the countries within this continent become the main location for a sub-series of games. Before the birth of modern Zamuria, there existed an ancient Zamurian civilization, an advanced population of various factions. This civilization was granted seven sacred treasures called the Septarians by the sky god Eidos, who serves as this series' main deity. And the main factions of ancient Sumeria were divided based on their affiliation to one of the seven treasures. The inception of modern Sumeria began after an event called the Great Collapse. We're not aware of the causes as of yet, but it was an apocalyptic event that caused the destruction of the ancient Sumerian civilization, with the remaining survivors plunged into a dark age for 500 years. It was the Great Collapse that birthed the first year of the post-apocalyptic Septium Calendar, which acts as this series' main timeline. After a half millennia dark age, the Septium Church established itself and provided solace to the population with the introduction of religious teachings directed to the sky goddess Eidos. It was from these teachings that balance was finally achieved and the dark ages of Zamuria came to an end. The seat of the church itself was based in the holy land of Altaria, a land which we know very little about as of yet, but it acts as the headquarters of the second arm of the Septium Church, the Grausritter. The Grausritter are an organisation dedicated to finding ancient Septarian artefacts in order to maintain order in Zamuria. Within the Grausritter there exists an elite band of knights called the Minion, a group of twelve who themselves are tasked with some of the more arduous tasks. In the year 1150 of the Septium Calendar, the Orbal Revolution takes place, which sees the practical utilisation of the universe's mysterious Orbal energy. The innovation itself is akin to a industrial revolution, and is later mass-produced so that all parts of Zamuria can benefit. But due to the capabilities of Orbal technology, it also brought about the potential for destructive weapons, which becomes an important cornerstone of diplomacy in the Trails games. In the year 1202 of the Septian calendar, we delve into the series proper, starting chronologically with the Trails in the Sky arc. This series follows the adventure of two siblings, Estelle and Joshua Bright, who are on their way to become junior bracers. The Bracer Guild is a non-governmental civilian faction that operates all over Zamuria, and it aims to protect the peace by aiding and assisting the citizens with errands and protection missions. It holds differing influence depending on what country you find them in, but they do hold a significant role in pretty much all of the games that you play. 
Throughout the Trials in the Sky games, Estelle and Joshua meet many different characters who join them on their journey as they travel through LaBelle. Throughout that two year period that the first two games take place, they uncover a coup, the remnants of an ancient civilization, and a discovery of a much greater threat. Upon the events of the third game, we see the beginnings of both Trails of Zero and Crossbell, and Trails of Cold Steel and Erebonia, meaning that everything is now taking place concurrently. This is what makes the Trails games such a joy to play from a world building perspective. Each game has its own story, which unfolds as you play through, but there is also an overarching story that makes up the whole Trails subseries arc, a more sinister and greater plot that can only be fully understood by playing all the games. For example, you may see an event in Trails of Cold Steel, but have no idea as to the cause, and the only way to find out what happened is to play Trails of Zero. Another great thing that the Trails games do is that they truly reward your time and effort. In some games you'll get little easter eggs referring to previous games and you'll hear about events that you won't fully understand unless you've seen it for yourself. It's this sense of knowing and building the events in your mind that just makes me jiggle with glee at times. At the end of the day you're putting about 50 hours of gameplay on average into each of these games but you never feel that the series doesn't deserve that time. Every event pushes the story forward and everything has a purpose. However, a great story is one thing, but if the ensemble of characters is weak, then everything falls apart, and I am happy to announce that the Trails games also hit this one out of the park. With such a large universe, it stands to reason that you're going to be encountering a lot of characters, and that rings true with the Trails series. Each game has a myriad of main and supporting members that you'll meet through your journey, or will join the party proper. With such a large cast, it's easy to get lost in the maze of names and arcs, but this is something that the Legend of Hero series doesn't suffer from. Every character, even the side characters, have their own goals, and their own motivations that drive them forward. Nothing feels cookie cut and pasted on, all the characters feel genuine and relatable, and they all develop in meaningful ways without losing sight of what their character is truly about. Some characters even get full on redemption arcs, being the main antagonist in one game, but becoming your ally and a potential playable character in a future one. And it really does mean something, because you've witnessed the struggles, you've played through the story, and you understand their reasoning. That's the brilliant thing, even the so-called bad characters at times have motivations that appear just and right. Due to the length of each series as well, the development feels organic, it doesn't feel rushed, and you feel that these characters truly deserve the development that they get. It's amazing that, with such a large cast of characters, that no one gets left behind, and it makes them all that much more endearing. The interactions and relationships between the characters feel realistic, and on more than one occasion have put a smile on my face as I see it unfold and grow before me. I also feel that the Trails games get the main enemies correct. They truly feel powerful, intelligent and sinister, and it's like you're overcoming insurmountable odds to finally beat them. It gives you the impression that you're aiming for the peak, and when you finally get there at the apex of your journey, you truly feel ready for the challenge. A good example of this is in Trails of Cold Steel, where the main character, Reen, is defeated three times by a particular adversary before he finally overcomes him in one-on-one -on -one combat. It shows experience and growth, and a respect to the strength of the enemies you're encountering that you have to constantly get knocked down before you finally earn your victory. Finally, it stands to reason that with all of these events taking place concurrently, that there will be some crossover between cast members from different series, and though this doesn't happen too often in the games that I've played so far, I feel that Neon Falcon has again done this perfectly. So there is a spoiler coming up for Trails of Cold Steel 2 here guys, so if you don't want to see that, please skip forward to the timestamp to get to the end of the video, otherwise, let's keep going. Near the end of Trails of Cold Steel 2, there's an interaction between two characters from Trails of Azure and Trails of Cold Steel. In this segment of the game, you're playing as Lloyd and Risha from Trails of Azure, and are nearing the end of your mission when they encounter Reen and Altina, who are there to thwart them. Since you're playing from the perspective of the Crossbell duo, you're experiencing that sense of mystery and fear as you fight. You're facing not only a pair of strong individuals, but you're facing someone with a power beyond your understanding it gives the sense that you're outmatched. However, skip forward after the fight and you again come back to the perspective of Reen, a normal student of Thor's military academy with his own class, his own friends and his own life. The contrast is stark, but it's so effective. Currently, the Trails in the Sky games in both Trails of Cold Steel 1 and 2 have been localised and are available on PlayStation and PC. 
Trails of Cold Steel 3 is in line for localization, and I'm pretty certain that Trails of Cold Steel 4 will also get the same treatment. Unfortunately, Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure have not been localized, nor have they been released for PC, and they're currently only available on PSP. But I'm hoping that in the future, these games will also get the same treatment. There are English patches available online if you really want to play them, or, alternately, you can try and learn Japanese. <laughs> And there we go guys, that's why I believe that the Legend of Heroes series is the magnum opus of JRPG world building and storytelling. If you want a cast of characters that you can adore, and if you want a world that you can relate to, look no further than this masterpiece by Neon Falcon. This is something that has never been done before and I firmly believe it will never happen again. You know, this story could take decades to complete. And that's the beautiful thing, that even with the end of Trails of Cold Steel, there's so much more opportunity, there's so much more to explore in Zemuria. I firmly believe that there will be a sub-series in the final major superpower on the continent, which is the Calvert Republic. However, they can go further afield to lands which they have mentioned before, and we know have a backstory that as of yet are pretty much unknown to us as the player base. And I personally can't wait to see what Neon Falcon comes up with next. Until next time guys, I'll see you later.